Welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Hi everybody, tonight we're going to begin a new study in what's called the Gospel according to Luke, sometimes St. Luke. And when you think about that phrase, the gospel according to, maybe that's a little off-putting, maybe that's a little religious. Think about it called a biography of Yeshua by somebody who came about a decade later, whose name was Luke, a doctor, a medical doctor. And we're going to see him functioning in a scientific way throughout the record of this book. Pretty remarkable that we've got a fisherman who can write like Peter, and we've got, and John, and we've got a doctor, we've got a son of a preacher man like Mark and a tax collector like Levi or Matthew. He's called Levi, Levi in the Gospel of Luke. All kinds of people writing a biography about Yeshua. And we could do the same thing. Each of us has had an encounter with the living God. Each of us has had some experience that brought us into relationship with him. This afternoon into the shop, young Jewish woman came in who's a new believer, newish believer. And she wanted to get a Siddur and she wanted to get a Bible and she's getting married in five weeks. She's She's pretty, it's pretty great to meet her and lives on the northern beaches. And in probably a minute, maybe 90 seconds, I asked her, could you tell me, how'd you get into this? And she told me her story lightning fast, and it was wonderful. How she was raised in Melbourne, Jewish home, went into Baha'i, went into a certain, what we would call sociological cultic Christian community in Southwest Sydney, and tried to, as she called it, evangelize them into Baha'i, and she realized that they they had something better than she had. Anyway, it was just really yeah. beautiful to listen to her quick story. And I thought, if she wrote a biography of Yeshua with me, what might be included? What would she add that none of us would add? What might she leave out that all the rest of us would put in? Each person in faith has a story to tell. And I think that's really great in these days. Luke records about 30 episodes and teachings that none of the other guys write about. We'll try to highlight those as we go through this. He certainly majors on the birth narrative that Mark doesn't even mention at all, and John barely whispers if he mentions it at all. Matthew and Luke are the two genealogical guys, but Matthew just does genealogy, says the birth, and now let's get to it. Luke is going to take two full chapters to unpack this, uh, almost three chapters really, because we're going to include the genealogy later. Uh, so much about the beginnings of Yeshua. I like that about him. I like the care that he he takes in explaining almost academically or scientifically who is Yeshua. End of the day, we're going to all come up with an understanding of who Yeshua is. We weren't there. Luke wasn't there. Luke joins the apostolic band in Acts chapter 16, a decade at least, if not 15 years, after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Yeshua. I look forward to seeing what he sees and understanding how he got to his conclusion. Verse 1, in Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well. In other words, a whole lot of folk are biographing Yeshua. We know Matthew, we know Mark, we know John. He seems to say that there's a whole lot of other folk who are writing gospels. And he said, well, it seemed fitting for me. I ought to add my voice to it too. Why? Because I've investigated, verse 3, everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, which makes me think he's got the timeline the most precise. I'm going to argue against that later, but he seems to say, I, my plan is to be, it happened here, then this happened, then this happened, then the end. That's what he sounds like he's going to try to do. Verse 3 ends with most excellent Theophilus. This is a person to whom he's writing. It's also a common name in that time. Friend or love of by God, God's love friend, right? So it's uh, possibly a character name that he invented. Like I could say, you know, I was down downstairs and I was witnessing to Louis Cohen. It's just a, a made up name, but it's a beautiful name. It could be the person to whom he's writing. It could be the patron who's paying for the papyrus. We don't know. It's the same fellow who's introduced in Acts chapter one, as Luke wrote both Luke and the book of Acts to this person, Theophilus. So what he wanted to 
to write about, verse 1, the things accomplished among us. He's writing about real story. This isn't fable. It's not a Greek myth. This is real, raw data. And how does he know? He wasn't there. Verse 2, they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. Who might that include? Paul wasn't an eyewitness at the beginning. So the early apostles, that's right, Peter, James, John, etc., and some of the women. Who's the first woman who understood the person of Yeshua? No. Mary, the mother, mother. Mary, the mother of Yeshua. Yes. So exactly. it's fitting that we're going to get probably through Luke's voice, that is Luke's pen, the story from Miriam herself. It's highly likely that he interviewed Miriam and from her lips and the story that she told, retold, and loved to tell. So this is, I want to say, this is the gospel according to St. Miriam before it's the gospel according to St. Luke. I mean, this is the most detail of the birth narratives of both John the Baptizer and of Yeshua. And I like that he says they weren't just witnesses, but they were servants of the word. They had their role down in relationship to the Almighty. They weren't commanders. They were servants of who Yeshua is. And verse 4, the purpose, so that you may know the exact truth about the things which you've been taught. There's no wavering. There's no shadow. There is light on the information. The information is accurate. And you have already been taught this. I just want to make sure you got it down accurately. That's beautiful. See, that's scientific, isn't it? You want to have a second corroboration or a third witness to help make all things confirmed. That's the prologue. Then verse 5, we get introduced to the story of the infancies. Is the infancy of John and the infancy of Yeshua. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, Zacharias, the division of Abiyahu. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Who are the daughters of Aaron? Compare that to the first part of the sentence. There was a priest named Zacharias. Who are priests? But sons of Aaron. So he married inside the Aaronic grouping. A Levite married a Levite, which is exactly the right thing it should be. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elisheva. They were both righteous in the sight of God. We're going to compare and contrast these two, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Luke makes it clear that there's going to be a contrast. They're both from good stock. They both have good names. What does Elisheva mean? Elisheva, God swore. God has sworn. God swears. Not in the sense of cussing, but making an oath. And his name, Zechariah, God remembers. So both have the name of God in their name. Both are priestly people. You see, they're both kosher. They're both righteous in the sight of God, both walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. These guys are as, uh, it's a beautiful couple walking down the, the, the street, but boom, boom, verse seven, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. So they both had no child. They're both old and Elizabeth is barren. Come on, Luke, can't you say that something's wrong and they just didn't have a child? But in those days, the woman was responsible and we may not like it, but that's the way it was. So she she was barren. And what does that cause in the Jewish society in those days? Yeah, she was in a way cursed. Yeah, there's some disparaging remarks that ought to come somebody in the community. How huh, they think they're righteous, but psh, if they really were, they'd have several children and grandchildren. Now it happened while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division. So he's, he's at work, right? He's on the job and he's doing what kind of job? Yeah, he's there in the holy temple. He's doing holy holy things. He's not just fishing and bringing in fish for the family. I mean, he's doing holy stuff, avodah, according to the custom of the priestly office. He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So he's got this sacred mission. He's got to go in and keep the incense burning. So he's burning the incense. He's making sure that there's a good supply. He's doing the right thing. It is a moment that we see him. I love that. It's not just he went to the temple to pray. He's there burning incense doing an actual function. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. So it's an exact moment. You're going to see that from Luke over and over. He's precise because he is a scientist. Not in the 21st century sense, but in the first century sense. An angel of the Lord appeared to him. Wait a minute. Angels don't rock up. But once every Bible book, <laughs> angels don't just show up uh, on Tuesday and Thursday um, at twice a month. I mean, they come in once every long, life for people. An angel appeared
appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Exactly lo an exact location. The altar of incense is there at the, except for the Day of Atonement, it's inside the Holy Place. And to the right of it, as you face it, would be just a, it's, I think it's a marker to show exactitude and to show precision and to disallow challengers who say, you're just making this up. No, really, you can see that there was a footprint, perhaps, mm -hmm. at the right side of the altar of incense, or there seemed to be some something that came the next day. There's corroboration, which will be very important. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. You think? Angels don't show up in his life. That's probably the first. He's an old man. Can you imagine, as an old man, you've never had an encounter with God. Boom, you're there. You're doing your regular function. You're there on the right side of the altar. I'm sorry, you're there at the altar, and just next to you is, a, is an angel. I don't know how big he is. All I know is he knows that it's an angel. And fear gripped him. Epipipto. I mean, it really grabbed hold of him. But the angel said, hey, don't be afraid. Angels say that all the time in the Bible. They're just very, hey, calm down. It's okay. It's just me. Yeah. What do you mean just you? And here's here's an angel. It's fear inspiring. Right. And yikes, if he, de if he says, don't fear, don't be afraid, it's because the natural reaction is to be afraid. For your petition has been heard. What petition? We haven't been introduced to a petition. What's the petition? A child. That's right. His wife is barren. He's an embarrassment in society. His wife is shamed. He doesn't want that for his wife. He wants good for his wife and for the mishpacha. Beautiful man. I like this guy. For your petition's been heard. Hallelujah, he would think. Wow, this is great. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Hallelujah. And you'll give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll drink no wine, no liquor. Never heard of Dan Murphy. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn away many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It's he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. What was Zachariah's prayer? I just want a kid. I don't I don't want this big shot. I don't want I don't want this forerunner. Hey, wait a minute. This is some madness. It must be the incense getting into my head. I must be dreaming. This can't be. Look at his reaction. Zachariah said, how will I know this? I'm an old man. My wife's advanced in years. I'm old. My wife's old. This ain't going to happen. So you want to say, well, why'd you bother God in prayer? If you don't think you're going to have this baby, what are you praying? Why are you wasting God's time? But I think he's overwhelmed with the role of his baby to come. He is saying, oh, I just heard you. I heard the whole paragraph, but come on, man. Really? This can't... Pfft. No, I'm, and then he goes back to the I'm old thing. I don't think his first reaction is I'm old. I think he's overwhelmed. Now, it doesn't say that, but that's I'm projecting. You'll forgive me for that. But this role of the turning the father's hearts back to the children, what's that a quote from? Malachi. There's only 12. Malachi predicts this about Elijah, who's going to come and bring the hearts of the parents to the children and the children to the parents. He's going to restore family. He's going to restore relationships. But he will go before him, verse 17, our verse adds as a forerunner, but basically that's what he's going to go before this guy. There's a guy coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. So the your boy's going to be in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he's going to be the announcer. Here's somebody. And who is it, right? So Zechariah is responding, we could say biblically, not in faith. That's what we could say. He's not really believing. He's been praying for just a little Yossi. You know, he hasn't been praying for little Navi, you know, the prophet. He wasn't praying for the greatest guy on the planet. He just wanted a, a puppy. You know, he just wanted his son. The angel said, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. That is a pretty amazing self-introduction. And I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news, this evangel. And behold, which means look out, same word that Matthew used a lot, idui. You shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you didn't believe my words, which will be 
fulfilled in their proper time. What an encounter, what a moment. What would he write in his journal? Dear diary, today an angel showed up next to me. I was just working. I was just doing my regular business before God. I'm an old guy. And he said I was going to have this prophet who was going to turn the hearts of, it's going to be like Elijah. What the heck? That, that, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. So then I said, how can I be? Because I'm old. And he struck me with muteness. The old King James was dumb. Remember, you deaf and dumb. So he couldn't speak. He could hear, maybe. But he couldn't speak. So he had to use sign language or things that little babies to point and uh, couldn't communicate. That strips him of his job, doesn't it? Because part of the job of a priest is to pray and to teach. The priests were mediators between the people and God and between God and the people. He couldn't do either. Oh, he could go light the fire in the temple, but he couldn't communicate. He couldn't say the right prayer. In fact, the petition he offered had been heard by the Lord, but he couldn't say another one. Couldn't say another petition because his mouth was silent. That's pretty harsh judgment, don't you reckon? There were 24 orders of priests, of families of priests. So he was still around the temple, whether he was functioning in a servile role or just sideline. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Zach. A lot of good you are around here. One, you're old and two, you can't speak. So it's, it's unclear. All what I do know is that this silence is a judgment from heaven because he did not believe God's. Do you think that that's too harsh? Do you think that he didn't believe God's word? I mean, think about it. You're an old guy. You've been praying and the angel says, hey, you got it. And your guy's going to be the big guy. And you say, you're kidding me. That's crazy. Really? Me? Yo, that's, that's, how can that be? Isn't that just a natural communication? Isn't it harsh then that God said you're going to be mute? Okay. Not permanent. So it's seasonal, but he doesn't know that. You ever lost your voice? Yeah. And, and the, <laughs> it's hard. It turns out it's going to be a nine month sentence. Yeah. He's not going to be able to speak for <laughs> almost a year. Yeah. It would be memorable in his life. He would forever remember. And it would be a point of conversation every year at the Passover table. Remember that time when I, oh boy, I didn't mean that. And Johnny, listen, kiddo, you, when God speaks, you better do what God says. Yeah. Just say, yes, sir. The people, verse 21, were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he did come out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized he'd seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. So here he is, first day learning his uh, sign language course. And it's really totally frustrating. He had no way to communicate to them. They had no way to learn from him. Everybody's at a loss as to what happened. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. Wow, what a sad story. But after these days, verse 24, Elizabeth, his wife, in case you think there's another one, became pregnant. Huh, I wonder how that happened. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, Woo, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor on me to take away my disgrace among men. Look what happened. Hallelujah. She's over the moon about God's bringing a baby into her life. It was a natural birth. It wasn't supernatural. They obviously had relations and he couldn't communicate. That's got to be weird. I, I just think she's saying, honey, what happened? And he's, <laughs> he's communicating. You know, he'll write, might ask for a writing implement, which we'll see. Later. But he can't communicate. All he does is point to the bedroom and say, let's go, you know. <laughs> and then five months, obviously two months, three months later, she said, oh, my mama, I I'm a ba I'm gonna have a baby. I mean, this is exciting as all get out. And by fifth month, she's shouting hallelujah because her disgrace, disgrace, is removed that she didn't have it. I think there's part part of the problem is that her husband is muted and he's an embarrassment to the family. And then she's now pregnant at a ripe old age. There's a lot of social squabble going on in inside them. And also the time of physical appearance would be clear by five months. I think that those are all factors. Hmm. Verse 26, we see a new story. So that's the infancy of John, the first section. Now we're going to see the infancy of Yeshua somewhat introduced. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Some people say that, yes, it's that. Some people say it's the sixth month of the year, which is Elul. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Of course, the word virgin is the only word for virgin in Greek, parthenos, and it's a literal translation of the, the same word as used in the Septuagint from Isaiah 7:14. Parthenos. In Hebrew, it's Alma, but the Septuagint, the Greek 
writings of the rabbis, 150 BC used Parthenos instead of anything else that they might have for Alma in Isaiah 7, 14. It means a woman who's never had a man. She is, in fact, verse 27, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Do you see how methodical he is in writing this? He doesn't say, there's Mary, and he's all excited. He's very careful in the description. Her name is Mary. She's descended from. She's engaged to. This is very carefully written. And coming in, he, who's that? Gabriel, said to her, Hail Mary, full of grace. You ever heard that one? Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. That's kind of cool. Reminds me of the greeting of the angel to Gideon. Hail, mighty warrior. Reminds me of so many times. How you do? Hello. That hail just means hello. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what this kind of salutation is. Now, she's not disbelieving. She's just a little weirded out. Huh. Wonder, wonder. I wonder what this is. Okay. Leave it there. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. In other words, he assumes that she's afraid. You have found favor, paris, grace, with God. And behold, there it is again, you do. You will receive, I'm sorry, conceive in your womb, bear a son, and you'll call his name Yeshua. He'll be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, whatever Zacharias heard, whatever level we could call that, like 95% greater than he ever anticipated, this has to be 195% greater. Every Jewish mother thinks she's going to become the mother of Messiah. Yes. But my, oh my, yes. this is this is, is the strongest, strong. this is the strongest wording you could ever imagine. You're going to have the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's messianic. There's no missing that. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Forever? This is, this is clearly the messianic hope that young Miriam, young Mary, who's probably an early teen, had ever heard. His kingdom will have no end. This is exactly what she's heard from her infancy that the Messiah would be and fulfill. Miriam said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? What does that sound like in light of the story? How can this be? I'm an old man, he said. She said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. But there's something different. No virgin has had a baby ever before. But old men have had babies before. Think of one. Abraham. Abraham. There you go. 99 years old when he has one. He says, and Sarah, his wife, Sarai, remember? What did she do when she heard the angel say? She yeah. laughed. She laughed, which is why we call his name ah. Isaac, Yitzchak, right? So when, when you think about the precedent for old people having babies has happened. It's already been laid down, but no virgin has had babies before. So the angel can be more gracious to Miriam than he was to Zacharias because Zacharias had the history, had the learning. He's a priest. He's been teaching the people. This is what God did with our father Abraham. But he didn't hold on to it personally. Miriam says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. No virgins have ever had babies before. The angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So he doesn't say, you foolish woman, I'm going to take care of this. You're out of here. You're mute or you're going to limp the rest of your life. No, he says, God will take care of it. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God or King James. That which comes forth from you will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. She who was called barren is now in her sixth month. So, wow, not only are you experiencing this, but you've got a second cousin somewhere whom you know as Elizabeth. Your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age. You think you're doing well, and you are. Sister, you've got a relationship who's going to understand you too. Because the first thing that Miriam understands, wait a minute, I'm a virgin. What are you talking about? I'm going to have a kid. You know what kind of social stigma that's going to cause yeah. in the neighborhood? No one's going to believe me. Joseph's not going to believe me. The neighbors aren't going to believe me. Yes. What are you, Mashugi? I can't do this. However, she bad. hears Elizabeth is pregnant. She who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said nothing against it. What'd she say? Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be to me according to your word, the angel left. She, she took it on board. She believed. Her question was not one of unbelief, but one of real honest to goodness question. How does that work? How, how am I supposed to do this? I've never heard of anyone doing this. I have no precedential Jewish teaching. I can see problems, but hey, if you've 
got this under control, I'm going with you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High overshadow you. That which comes forth from you will be the Son of God. You're going to bear in your body the Messiah. I'm in. I'm all in, she said. Isn't that glorious? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Then I, I like the way Luke makes it clear between Zacharias and Miriam in how they related to the announcement of the miracle of birth through their being. The angel departed from her, verse 38. What do you reckon she was feeling just then? The angel left and now she feels, oh, she'd be splashed with all kinds of joy about what? Okay, that the Messiah was coming. The Messiah was coming through her. So she's looking down the road as well. Not only my boy is going to be the Messiah, I got to put that on my CV. No, no, she didn't know the death of Messiah. She just saw him coming. What's he going to do? What did the, the announcement say? That he would rule. His kingdom would have no end. He'd reign over the house of Jacob forever. He'll be given the throne of his father, David. He'll be the son of the most high God. So it sounds like victory. So verse 39, at that time, meaning right then, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah. And, you know, city of Judah, that's going to be south. It's going to be a good long distance from uh, Nazareth. I, uh, I got to check this out. I'm going to go yeah. check out. Yo, cuz, whoever entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. There was something immediate. What happened? Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and the baby leaped in her womb. Now, we know that babies do all kinds of motion and commotion inside the mother's belly for the whole time they're in there. You can actually go up to a pregnant woman who's generous and say, you want to feel the baby? Sisters in something. You want to feel the baby? Oh, he's kicking. You want to feel it now? But we always call it kicking. What did this baby do? He's leaping in the womb. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she cried out with a loud voice. Remember uh, when we talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that 15 times in the record of the Newer Testament, people are filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. 15 times. And every time, speaking follows. Every time. And this is the first. Somebody speaks. In this case, Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit and she cried out, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Yeah. When she encountered her, her relative and the relative Mary said, I'm home. You know, <laughs> she just, she greeted. She said hello. She brought her greeting. Shalom Aleichem. Immediately the baby leaped. So John the baptizer hears his cousin Miriam say shalom. He rejoices. The baby's five, six months in already. He's heard the, his mother speaking. He's heard nothing else. He's never heard his father speak. Now he hears another relative and he, according to this story, knows who it is. The mother of Messiah or mother of, verse 43, my Lord. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. So the baby didn't just kick. It wasn't just a natural kick. He was leaping and shouting hallelujah inside. There's something about recognition of Messiah that's going to be a Lucan consideration. He's going to always come back. To, what do you do when you recognize Messiah? Right from the beginning, Elizabeth and her boy recognized. Behold, when the sound of your greeting. Okay. And verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what's been spoken to her by the Lord. What's her testimony? What's her conviction? What's she saying? She's Elizabeth. praising God. So Elizabeth sees her relative coming. So here's the Shalom Aleichem. Baby leaps. She shouts, hallelujah. Glad to have you. Blessed are you. And blessed are you because you believe there would be a fulfillment. She had not heard from Miriam. She didn't get the email. There was no telegram. Miriam said, I'm going to be sending you myself. There was none of that. She just rocked up on the house and Elizabeth by faith understood that Miriam by faith had come and believed and there was a reunion of a family reunion. They didn't wait till Anzac Day. It was pretty remarkable. There's something powerful in faith and speaking. Look what those words are. Who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary didn't even tell Elizabeth anything and Elizabeth knew that God had spoken to her. Mother of my Lord, Lord. How did she know that? That's all it was. The Holy Spirit who spoke to her that whatever happened to me, my goodness, I can see my, my relative. She's pregnant. I know I didn't get an invitation to the wedding. I know the word had gotten around that Miriam was, Mary said this, and this is called the Magnificat. It's probable that Hannah's prayer was sung by the women, kind of like we sing choruses yeah. today. We are the world. We are the children. Mary said, my soul exalts 
exalts the Lord, my spirit has rejoiced to God. Uh, I am a happy camper. And the reason is, it's all about God. I'm all about him. My spirit's rejoicing. He's regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Behold, from this time on, all generations will be blessed. I am a graced woman because of what God has done. She held on to the words of the angel who said that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. There will be some photograph of him on you, if you will. His mercy is upon generation after generation. It says, and that's exactly from Hannah's prayer. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers. It sounds like a, any psalm, and it may be that she's informed by many psalms. She probably had been a regular prayer of these psalms, and she's kind of going back to it. As she goes back to it, she's sorting out what is going to happen in my life. I just I came in a hurry to Elizabeth's house. She said, blessed is the, you're going to be blessed forever. All the women are going to call you that forever. The mother of my Lord should come. So Mary's getting confirmation after confirmation of what is going to happen to her. He's brought down rulers, exalted those who are humble, filled the hungry with good things and sent away the... He's given help to Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our father, to Abraham and his seed forever. He's, she's citing all these covenantal promises of heaven to Israel and I guess to me, she's saying. And I love that she owns the psalm, that she owns the words of scripture. When you read the Bible, it's not merely an academic book. Here's Luke putting in the testimony of scripture being owned by the woman who probably advised him on the story. So Mary is there with her. It's the sixth month. She stays with her about three months and then goes home. So wait a minute. Shouldn't she stay until the birth of the baby? Come on. She's pregnant six months, six months, nine plus three. I can do the maths. It precisely says she returned home. Then it's time for her to give birth. So remember, he's writing an accurate account in time. I don't understand why Mary goes home. Maybe she's a little intimidated. Maybe she's a little scared. Maybe she's got the courage to go back home and face the music. Verse 57, now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. He gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her and they were rejoicing with her. I don't know that they were rejoicing before then, but they were at the birth. Hallelujah. You have a boy and there's great joy in the community. Where she had been disgraced, now she's being graced. Where she was a scandal, now she is, she's a blessing. Verse 59, it's time for the bris. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They were going to call him Zechariah after his father. But the mother answers it, nope, nope, he shall be called Yochanan. And they said, but there's nobody alive in their family by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. They made signs to him? Why wouldn't they just talk to him? He's not deaf, Mm -hmm. but he can't speak, right? And they made signs. And he asked for a tablet and wrote. You gotta love that. His name is John. And they were all astonished. Shemo Yochanan. Just two words in Hebrew. And at once his mouth was open. So as soon as he, if you will, testified to God giving him a new name and agreed with his wife and agreed with the angel and agreed with God, faith overrode the, if you will, curse, temporary curse of being mute, of his faithlessness. So faith wins in the end for Zechariah, which I think is beautiful. What's interesting to me in this is this whole naming thing. In modern days, as Rochelle said, it's customary to not name someone after a living relative. It's a Shonda. You, in fact, carry on the memory of the person who's passed away in the naming of a son or grandnephew or somebody like that. And the reason it has changed, and I love showing you that Judaism is not a monolith, it's not uniformitarian. What is Judaism today is not the way Judaism always was. It has continued to change over the millennia. What caused the change is the disregard, if you will, of resurrection of the dead. Jewish people today don't believe in resurrection in the same way we studied it just a few weeks ago. Because my uncle Larry is not going to be raised from the dead, I will keep his memory perpetuated by naming my great nephew after Larry. Whereas in the first century, certainly in this time of Elizabeth and Zechariah, they did believe in the resurrection of the dead, not the Sadducees, Pharisees, and I'd say the majority of Jewish people did. If that be the case, then you don't need to name a person after a dead relative because we believe that when my grandfather passed, he'll go somehow into a heavenly state. I don't need to perpetuate his memory through the naming child. In those days, you named after a living relative. 
that should be startling to those who know Judaism. So his name was John. The mute ended, the curse ended. His tongue was loosed. He began to speak in praise of God. Verse 64. Isn't that awesome? The first thing you want to do after being, if you will, cursed with, uh, as a result of your faithlessness, is to say, hallelujah, shout glory and praise to God. Fear came on all those living around them. Why? Why did fear come on them? Yeah, I would say it's, and the baby, and he can talk. So two majestic things happen. Eight days ago, the baby was born. That's pretty great to two old Jewish people. And then Zechariah can speak and he's been silent. I agree. I think it is the fear of the Lord. Came on all those living and all those matters were talked about in all the hill country. of the, I mean, all over Jerusalem, all over the hills. And everybody kept in mind, what will the child turn out to be? The hand of the Lord was certainly with him. And Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, second time it's happened. What's going to happen? Speaking. And he prophesied, saying, blessed be the Lord. He visited us. He raised up a horn of salvation. He spoke by the prophets, and he quotes the prophets, to show mercy, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. I get it now. Abraham. I should have recalled what happened with Abraham. The oath he swore. My wife is named God swore. I should have remembered all this stuff. And that we might serve him without fear. Holiness. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Verse 76. You'll go on before the Lord to prepare his way. There's that Isaiah quote. To give to his people the knowledge of Yeshua. Salvation. Soteria. By the way, the word sozo and soteria, salvation, is going to be huge in the book of Luke. Not because he's a theologian who wants to make sure you've got your salvation card punched, but the word sozo also means healing, and he's a doctor. Salvation for Luke always includes personal healing by the forgiveness of their sins, verse 77. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. Don't you like that phrase? Verse 78, the sunrise, the anatole of uh, from on high will visit us. Um, it, it isn't in Greek, but it is by the editors here, 78. To shine on those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. So he's citing a lot of Psalms, a lot of prophets. These guys are well entrenched in scripture and they're, they're singing the songs they've heard. I love singing scripture. I just, the other day, I heard a popular Christian band singing directly Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I've never heard this band sing anything except, you know, good words and, and, and positive stuff, but I'd never heard them sing scripture. And I think I've missed that. In the 70s, there was a group called Scripture in Song out of New Zealand that would find psalms and just sing them. And when I started in Messiah in 1971, all we did was take our guitar, open the Bible, and start singing. And it was great. And I've memorized a lot of Bible because of that. I encourage you to find Bible song. There, there are all kinds of people whose music is wondrously informed by Bible. You want to make sure you're memorizing Bible. Great thing to do in your shower. Anyway, it appears that Miriam knew that. She knew how to pray and sing. And certainly Zachariah did do. And the child, this is John, continued to grow and to become strong in spirit and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. That's it. That's the birth narrative, the infancy story of John. Yeshua is introduced. We're going to see him much more clearly next time. Mary's visit, John's birth. A lot happening that is not recorded in any other gospel or any other place. So we are, we're getting the backstory on John the Baptist. We're getting the backstory on his father, mother, on a, I think not a dysfunctional family at all but a very good family, a righteous family. And I'm glad Mary is introduced. That's Luke chapter 1. Before creation, before the world began, from earth's foundation, Yeshua the Lamb.